quite gentle and of course very modern apes, the last time you were with me here we discussed the nature of the anthropoids, early monkeys that were dominating the Eocene and the Oligocene. These guys would be fruitful and they would prosper and eventually some populations of them would split off and adapt to new environments, begetting the tailless wonders that we know, love, and are today the apes. But Given the sheer number of the hominids that exist during the Miocene, I think we're going to go ahead and split it up into three videos, the early, middle, and late Miocene time periods. The early Miocene was the true dawn of the planet of the apes, but before we can appreciate who these apes were, where they lived, and how they are perhaps related to us, we must first understand what it means to be an ape when compared to the earlier Old World monkeys. Apes today can be differentiated from old world monkeys by a unique suite of characteristics. Back before genetics, early taxonomists were troubled by the set of physical characteristics that separated the living apes from the old world monkeys, as these traits clearly applied to humans as well, firmly cementing us as members of the ape family Hominidae. Most obviously, apes lack prominent tails. We also have broad chests, mobile shoulders that are oriented dorsally, short and stiff lower backs whose vertebra have robust pedicles, and long clavicles that all support our orthograde posture. We also have mobile wrists and more primitive teeth when compared to old world monkeys. We have a unique appendix, a deeply arched palate, small incisive foramina, and larger brains for our body size. Living apes also have a wide range of sexual dimorphism, from monomorphic gibbons to extremely dimorphic gorillas, and they often use tools to accomplish tasks, just like us. Many living apes also have cultures that they pass down skills with some arbitrary rules attached that are population specific to their offspring. In our locomotion, living apes are highly diverse. Suspensory adaptations, high-speed brachiation, knuckle-walking quadrupedalism, and obligate terrestrial bipedality all characterize our family. Evolution then makes a prediction, right? The earliest apes should look and move a lot like the monkeys of that time period, but they should have a few traits that separate them, and a few precursor traits that will link them to the later traits that emerge in the Miocene that are held by the apes of then, and of course the ones today, the extants. Enter Proconsul and Akembo. Proconsul is known primarily from its remains at Rusinga Island where it has been well characterized, but this ancient ape has been found in many places in East Africa. It appears as early as 21 million years ago, and its ape traits make it stick out like a sore thumb as a hominoid. Sporting a tailless form, Proconsul and its cousin Akembo have gracile skulls with only moderate mid-facial prognathism and low alveolar prognathism. They have larger brains than their contemporaneous monkey kin, with incisors that are adapted for fruit consumption. They have canine teeth with a premolar honing complex, this is that constant honing that keeps them sharp, and male canines are around one and a half times the size of female canines, perhaps suggesting a social system that has high male competition. This honing complex is at its highest in Proconsul africanus and at its lowest in Akembo hesaloni when considering the members of the Proconsulidae family. Their postcrania continue this trend of primarily old world monkey characteristics, but a handful of ape traits. They have a medial torsion of the humeral head and a long curved back with a narrow chest, much like pronograde monkeys do today. However, like apes, they have a long thumb, although it isn't rotary as well as powerful flexors for branch gripping, and of course, again, they lack a tail. It's important to note that these guys did indeed have ape adaptations that were unique for the time period, but by and large, they're still pretty monkey-like. They're moving around in the trees in a quadrupedal arboreal fashion, and based off of their microwear and tooth morphology, they're eating much of the same stuff, right? We can tell that Proconsul and Akembo were indeed frugivores, and they probably finished developing their teeth by about age 7. Alongside Proconsul and Akembo was the genus known as Rongwapithecus. This ape, by and large, looked very similar to Proconsul and Akembo, with the primary differences being found in its teeth. Rongwapithecus is noted as being monomorphic in its canine teeth, meaning males and females had canines of the same height, much like gibbons or humans do, and that these canine teeth were blade-like and well adapted for shearing. This suggests that Rongwapithecus was invested in full livery as well as frugivory, and that its social system may have been oriented around single-pair family groups. 
However, caution must be exercised as sexual dimorphism or lack thereof can only be appropriately assessed with sufficient sample sizes of teeth or postcrania. Case in point, originally, there was much debate on the proconsul fossils at Rusinga Island. The fossils clustered into two sizes, one cluster ranging from 8 to 14 kilograms of body size, or around the size of a siamang, and the other with a range of 28 to 46 kilograms, around the size of a chimpanzee. The original question regarding these fossils is whether they represented two species of fossil ape, one that was small and one that was large, or a single, extremely sexually dimorphic species. If the latter was true, this would make Proconsul the most sexually dimorphic animal known to exist, with the largest males being nearly six times the size of the smallest females. Extensive work through the decades, however, both statistical and paleontological, has shown that there is indeed robust support for the presence of two two species at the site. We have the larger ape, which is known as Akembo nyanze, formerly Proconsul nyanze, and the smaller ape, which is Proconsul africanus. Larger than both, however, is Proconsul major, who was likely a bit larger than modern chimps. The early Miocene was home to more apes, though, than just Proconsul, Akembo, and Rongopithecus. Micropithecus is known for its diminutive size, as it is an ape that was roughly the size of a modern capuchin monkey. This means Micropithecus is the smallest known ape to have ever lived. Dendropithecus was originally thought to be a relative of modern gibbons due to its morphology lending itself to brachiation as well as its long and scimitar-like canine teeth. However, now it's been relegated to a stem ape. Limnopithecus, similarly, is thought to have been gibbon-like, although whether or not this ancient animal is the ancestor of modern hylobatids has yet to be seen. It may be more likely than Dendropithecus, however, as Limnopithecus is thought to be monomorphic in its large canine teeth, just like modern hylobatids. And Nyanzopithecus is another potential gibbon relative, although the consensus is currently that small apes appear to have convergently evolved gibbon-like facial features given these three species lack the definitive hylobatid synapomorphies. Afropithecus turcanensis is another unique hominin from the early Miocene in that, like Rongopithecus, it's thought to be monomorphic based on the canines of the sex specimens. Males and females of this large ape both had enormous tusk-like canines that are laterally splayed or jutting out a bit sideways. This is similar to what we see in modern members of the Pithecinae group, New World monkeys who use their large canines like can openers when feeding. These monkeys live in large polygamous groups, like many sexually dimorphic monkeys do, but there is pressure for both sexes to have large canine teeth for feeding. This means that in the case of Afropithecus turcanensis, social system remains mysterious. These apes, like our previous cast of characters, were also palmigrade and arboreal quadrupeds. Once again, you may be noticing a trend that these medium to large bodied apes are moving around a lot like monkeys. Peter Andrews notes in his book An Ape's View of Human Evolution that this monkey-like posture on locomotion seems to characterize around three-fourths of ape evolution. We're seeing all of these monkey-like adaptations, quadrupedalism, high frugivory, and a habitat that's going to be characterized by this strange open canopy woodland rather than the jungles or rainforest that we tend to picture when we think of apes evolving. The early Miocene was just the beginning, however, for the rise of the planet of the apes. Europe was opening up with a variety of new niches, and the path to Asia was becoming clear as well. And next time we're going to examine the new players of the middle Miocene, as well as the climate's role in the evolution of these creatures. Is it possible that bipedalism evolved convergently in multiple ape species in the middle Miocene, and paved the way for the hominins that would come in the late Miocene? Potentially. We'll also examine some of the potential candidates for the last common ancestor of all extant apes, of the African apes, and of humans and chimps.